Shalom, this is Rabbi Eric and Brit Am Messianic Synagogue, and we welcome you to our Foundations of Messianic Judaism class. This class is an open forum discussion class where you can ask questions about Messianic Judaism, about Judaism, about Christianity, about the connection between the two or the disconnection between the two. We found that we had quite a few people that were part of our congregation, they were attending regularly, they had been here for a while, and uh, they had lots of questions, but we didn't have a mechanism to answer those questions, and sometimes they'd be here for two months, three months, four months, or more while they were trying to get these questions answered, and for some reason, uh, they wouldn't just make an appointment or call me or email me, so we... Uh, we started this class to accomplish the goal of answering those questions. And that is some of our Shabbat school kids that you heard excited about going to their class. So anyhow, we always begin with prayer. We want to remember to pray for um, uh, the, those that are dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Laura, we want to pray. Thank God it wasn't as bad as it was projected to be, but as we say that, we need to understand there's still thousands of people that have been affected by it. We're glad it wasn't as bad as they said it was, but it was really bad, and if it was your home, you would think it was extremely bad. So we want to pray for for those people. Yeah, there's... Um, uh, 40 is that the number they're saying now okay nearly 40 people have passed away so please be praying for for those families please pray for Dave um, Putman who is having severe pain issues this morning please continue to pray for Robin and for Fred and for Jerry and Jerry and Jerry and for um, Sandy who is home and doing better um, and uh, we want to continue to pray for her, for Timothy, uh, for Raphael and Jeremy, for Miss Mabel, continue to pray for her. Uh, we just have a number of people that need prayer. Do we have prayer requests from the audience this morning? Miss Bobsey. Uh, pray for California. Pray for California with the fires? Yes. And, uh, the and the believers in California, you know, it's strange now that we're actually praying for persecuted believers in the United States. Isn't that a, like something that we would have thought you know, we, we would not be doing? But please pray for those that are being persecuted uh, in California and other uh, states that are not being allowed to meet even in homes and, and so on. So uh, just important to pray. Other requests? Jonathan. Pray for the Geigers. Uh, pray for all those that are being affected by COVID or COVID testing. You know, it's, it's interesting if you have, if I went and got tested for COVID today and I was found positive for COVID, according to the CDC, I only have to stay away from people for 10 days. But if I come in contact with somebody with COVID, I have to stay away from people for at least 14 to 21 days. So we need to be praying for these people that are, you know, having to not be able to work and other things because of just being in contact with somebody who's, uh, who's sick or might have, because this isn't even having contact with someone who has COVID. This is having contact with somebody who might have had contact with or might have. So we just need to be aware of that and be praying for, uh, for our friends. was burned right we there was one in california one in delaware these are chabad houses that are um uh, are being uh, burned down by the uh protesters these antifa people and we need to be praying for them we don't agree with the belief system of chabad uh, but they do believe in the one God of the Bible, and they are part of our greater community, and we want to pray for them. And 
Uh, the truth is that uh, Chabad belief system, although they believe that Schneerson uh, is the Messiah, is probably the closest Judaism to our belief system that there is because they abs abs ab actually believe in a, the idea of a human being the Messiah in that way and being resurrected and, uh, and those kind of things. So uh, we just need to be praying for them. We don't accept what they believe, but we do need to be praying for them as part of our community. So thank you for reminding me of that. Any other requests this morning? Pray for Marquita, Sam. Sam's business praise report, his uh, oil processing, his oil discovery, monitoring, monitoring business, yes. uh, got three contracts he hasn't had any since uh, February. February, so praise God for that, and that is very timely, yes, it is. so thank God for that. Amen, and pray for Joanne as her. Her job that she's had appears to be ending, and she's going to be looking for a place that her skills, which have been honed for 21 years, will be able to be put to use. So, yes. If we can not have any side conversations, it's really hard to hear the people speaking if they're side conversations, and it's even harder distracting to the people that are watching online. So, yes. Yeah, their house is supposed to be closing on either Tuesday or Tuesday or maybe Tuesday. So we, we're just praying for that, that that will go through. Yes. Shh. Yeah, pray for those that are working in food service, whether it's in restaurants or schools, but your particular prayer request is connected to the school system that you work in where they're having to do everything completely different and how they do lunches for children. Not only that, but everything is different because each school has a different percentage of students that are actually back in the classroom. So they have to adjust all of the recipes and all of the things that they're doing to be able to provide. So we want to pray for, for and, and all of our teachers and, and students that are back in school. And for the homeschool parents. Yes, ma'am. Um, my husband needs a job. Okay, and what, now is he here? No, he's not here. He's okay. Still. Okay, and what kind of work does he do? Is he, I, you said still, so that means he's planning on coming this way? Okay, yeah. so, so what kind of work does he do? Nuclear power for years. Nuclear power. Yeah. Okay. And he's also in a lab, a QA guy in the lab of the refractory. Okay. So we will pray for, uh, for an opening. Tom? Okay. David? Wonderful. Wonderful. How old are your children? Okay, so neither one of them are old enough to be going to the class yet. So, But I do want to tell you that the you said three and a half? Okay, we do have a nursery that is functioning that has three and a half year old activities. If he, if he feels comfortable. If not, we, I encourage families to stay together. So don't feel like you have to go anywhere because of that. But I just want to make you know. And the restrooms. Through that door, down the hall, to the right. So. Oh, good. So they already know. So I wasted all that time. Okay. So any other prayer requests? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. We need to, th this is important, and I'm going to talk a little more about that after, but we need to pray for this young man in Kenosha that righteous justice will prevail. Uh, none of us were there. None of us know what happened. Everything we're seeing in the media and everything that's being presented to us is being presented from a particular side to make a particular point. And we want to make sure that things are, are accurate and that if the young man did something wrong, then he should be punished as all people who do things wrong should be. And if he did not, he should not be punished 
because of political whims and uh, social uh, details. So any other requests? Okay, Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning. And Father, we just pray for all of these requests. We pray against violence in our nation. Father, two wrongs will never make a right, and if you try to justify an action by doing something evil, it will never bring about a righteous conclusion. Father, we need to do exactly what your word says, and that's to love you and to love one another. And Father, if we do that, and if we treat others as we would like to be treated, we will see change in our nation. And so, Father, I ask, first of all, that believers, those of us who proclaim to believe in the Bible, in the words that you gave us, that we would act like that. Father, that we would uh, stop choosing sides, stop being... Uh, justifying violent actions, and, and when I say that I'm talking about violent actions that are not protecting life but just destroying things. And Father, I ask that, uh, that you would help us to make a stand and be public about those statements. Father, I ask that you'll touch the hearts of the law enforcement people that are doing their job to protect and, and serve and that uh, they would not have their hearts um, broken to the point of uh, not doing their job because of this. Father, I also ask that any police officer that is operating outside of the legal system, outside of what is just and righteous and according to the laws, that he would be caught and prosecuted. And Father, that this is the way things should be. And Abba, I ask that you'll touch those that are sick amongst us and you will heal them. And Father, that you would help us to get a heart of a servant and a heart of a shaliach, a, a, um, an emissary, somebody who's going out to share your good news. Father, the time is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and there are souls that are in the balance. And Father, we need to get serious about sharing the good news of Messiah Yeshua. Father, we pray for our children. We pray for those that are in school, those parents that are teaching their kids at home and all the people that work in the school system. We pray especially for our first responders and doctors and nurses and others that are working in this extreme environment uh, as we're dealing with uh, COVID and all the other things that go on over this time period. Father, we pray for our government and we pray for the government of Israel. And we thank you for doing all the things you promised you would do in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, we're going to try to do something different this morning, uh, and that is, and you won't need that anymore. So thank you for your service. Um, as we try to make this more effective, uh, I've been getting more and more comments from people who say, I love this portion of what we do, and love the question and answer time, and love this, but Every time we go to somebody to ask a question, we end up with two or three or four or five minutes of airtime where the people that are watching the video don't hear anything, and then I repeat the question. So what I decided to do was to ask everybody who has a question to just write down your question on a piece of paper and hand it to me, and I'll just read the question and answer it, and then we won't have the dead space between and we'll be able to get more questions answered and the people that are watching online will be able to uh, receive more out of the service. So I have a couple of questions that have already been written. We have papers on the table there. So if you have a question, uh, please just write it down and I will do what I can to answer those questions. Um, I, again, for those that are uh, new and watching online, first of all, we thank you for tuning in. And also, we ask you to hit that watch party button so that other people can participate also. And uh, if you have questions and you're watching online, there's an email address on the, the comment thing or on the, uh, the description that you can just email and I'll answer your questions next week. So, uh, why is the ban of children to the 10th generation? Why so harsh? And what about... Ruth Lincoln. I'm sorry, I couldn't <laughs> read Ruth. Uh, I'm okay. 
Uh, the ban of this, you have to remember that we're dealing with uh, two groups of people, the Moabites and the Ammonites. Uh, Moab were the ones that uh, hired Bilam to uh, deceive Israel and try to curse Israel. And after that didn't work, they then sent their prostitutes into Israel and caused, uh, caused men to act in their baser level. It wasn't that, I mean, you can send prostitutes into a room and if the men are righteous, they're not going to fool with them anyhow. So this isn't all on them, but it is partial on the Ammonites if you remember, are the ones that just wouldn't give um, uh, bread, and water. bread and water to the Israelites when they came in. And they ended up attacking them later, and there's all kinds of things. Ammon, by the way, are the, um, the children of Lot and his daughters. Uh, so this is a problem that comes up from, from that. So why the tenth generation? Um, it's because their actions... Whenever you see, and I love the word you use, this is so harsh. Whenever you see a harsh judgment by God, if you will look, you'll find that the actions of either Israel or the people that are being described blurred the picture of God and his people or Yeshua and his redemptive plan. In other words, the picture, everything in God's word was written so that we would see God. This is a beautiful mural from Genesis through Revelation that tells the story of God's love for his people and his redemptive plan. And so every time you see someone, for instance, Moses, he was told to beat the rock the first time and then he was told to speak to the rock the second time. He beats the rock the second time instead of speaking to it. It blurred the picture of the two comings of Messiah. One coming he would suffer, the other coming he would be received and worshipped and praised. It blurred that picture. It's like if you had a beautiful mural and somebody just blotted out a portion of it so that people seeing it would no longer clearly see that. That's what happened. It's the same thing with Uzzah and the Ark of the Covenant. We look at the story of Uzzah and the Ark is being caught up, brought on the cart and... Uh, and then it's, the oxen stumble, the cart starts to fall, Uzzah sticks his hand up to protect the ark, and we think, ah, oh, that guy did a great thing. Lift up, reach the ark, but he touched the ark he wasn't supposed to. Uh, and it blurred the picture of Messiah Yeshua ultimately carrying the cross on his shoulders, which is the way the priests were supposed to carry the ark, all the things that went on in there, and it blurred the established picture that God had. So these events of Moab and Ammon, and Israel blurred the picture of what God was trying to do and show in his word. So anytime you see something, you know, wow, that seemed really harsh. You know, Moses, he led Israel for 40 years and all he did was beat a rock. I'd have beat the rock too if I were him. You know, all those things. If you look beyond that, you'll see that. Now, as far as Ruth, this is an interesting thing because you have to remember that these prohibitions are against Moabites and Ammonites. Ruth, although she was always a Moabitess or called a Moabitess, she laid aside her paganism and joined herself to Israel. So this is talking about Moabites and Ammonites who do not do that, who do not lay aside their paganism and, and they remain Moabites serving the gods of Moab or Ammonites serving the gods of Ammon. That's not the case in Ruth. And that's why when we see, for instance, in Solomon's day, the Queen of Sheba comes to Israel to see the glory of the temple and all that's there. She's a, a pagan who is allowed into the temple area, not into the holy places, but to the places that those that didn't serve God could go to. Ammonites and Moabites couldn't even go there uh, unless they became grafted into the people of Israel. And this is actually really relevant to us today. Because if you are a non-Jewish believer in Yeshua, you have been grafted into the olive tree, and you're no longer uh, a pagan or a heathen. You are now part of the olive tree of Israel. And as the scripture says, we can boldly enter into the holy place through the veil of Yeshua when he became that veil. So this is really relevant and needs to be understood. Ruth was allowed 
to be where she was because she had laid aside her paganism and accepted the God of Israel, and she was no longer viewed as an Ammonite or a Moabite. She was now looked at as an Israelite, though not a Jewess. And that's important because in today's world, we have a lot of people who believe that if a Gentile becomes a Messianic believer, that they become Jewish. And that is not so. There's still non-Jewish believers who have become part of the commonwealth of Israel. And that needs to be kept clear because there are distinctives within the body that require both Jews and non-Jews to accomplish the prophetic work that God has established. So that's really important. Great question. Thank you, um, Lincoln. Lincoln had a second question, but I'm going to, because, just because I don't want two Lincoln questions in a row. Let me go to Sam's question. Explain about the manna in Exodus 16, 11 through 20, verses storing up for hard times for the needy in. Uh, so let me look at Exodus 16, 11 and see what it actually says. Okay, manna from heaven, they journeyed in Elim. Uh, people were supposed to gather the day, but on the sixth day they weren't supposed to gather, and if it didn't last, I mean, if they didn't gather enough, they wouldn't have any. If they gathered too much, they wouldn't, it would turn putrid. It would rot. That's your question. So how do we deal with the manna that we wasn't supposed to be saved versus uh, storehouses and things for hard times and the needy? Right. In, in chapter 11, it talks about not gathering up any more than what you need. Right, right. But that's while they were, again... Right, that's while they, were, while they were in the wilderness and God was providing the manna, they were only supposed to get what they needed. They were supposed to, in other words, they had to trust God that every day they would come out, wake up in the morning, they would go out and he will have provided for them. Give us this day our daily bread is the statement of Yeshua that actually connects with that idea that we're depending on God to bring provision. The difference in the wilderness was they didn't have an ability to plant. They didn't have an ability to harvest. They didn't have, so God was providing all that for them supernaturally. But they were supposed to trust and only get enough for one day. And they weren't, and then on the, the sixth day, they were supposed to collect enough for two days and trust. So they had to, it was a double trust issue. One was they had to trust that on the, if the every other day of the week, that they could, they'd have enough for that day. On the sixth day, they had to trust that it wasn't going to rot at the end of that day, and they wouldn't have for the next day. So it's learning to trust that God will provide when we don't see it, and also that his provision will last if we need it to supernaturally because of his promises. Now that's different from storing up things today. First of all, we're not in the wilderness. We're not being supernaturally fed by God, although some of our children believe we are, you know, <laughs> that, you know, they, you know, it's kind of like the man who said, I have a miraculous table at my house. You know, I have a basket on the table and every night I put my clothing in this basket on this magical table. And when I get home at the, in the evening, uh, I get home and all the clothes are out of the basket. Miraculously, they're folded and in my drawer. It's, it's just, I don't know how this works. It's miraculous. I put them in the basket, come home, they're all done. Now, that is unfortunately how many people believe things happen today. It's not. And uh, we actually now have the ability to work and so on. And part of that is we work according to Ephesians so that we can give. Um, it's interesting, and, and a side note, because we're talking in Exodus here, but uh, when we go to Leviticus and we read about Passover, God connects Passover with gleaning. You will observe the Passover in, in uh, Leviticus 23, and then connected to Passover is leaving the corners of your field available for people to go to. God connects his supernatural redemption of us with our provision to others. And that we, our giving is an evidence of his provision. So all of that is, is part of that. I hope that answered your question. 
Um, people are adding questions to my pile here. We're putting things. We're going to have to get a system here. Okay, so just so you know, if you write a question, put it on my side of the bottle, and I'll know that I haven't done that one yet. And uh, I'll put the old ones there. Okay. Uh, who does the scripture refer to when it speaks of how to treat a stranger? There's no name on this. Um, the word stranger in Hebrew is the word ger, and there were three levels of gerim. Uh, a, a, you had a ger that was just a stranger, you know, somebody who just came through town. They're traveling from Egypt. They're going to Damascus on the way through. They're, they're not have any religious or spiritual connotations to their trip. They're just heading across. That's just a ger. The next level of ger is a ger who's kind of attached themselves to the, the nation, but they haven't attached themselves fully to uh, Judaism. And then the last ger is ger tzedek, which is the ger that actually follows Judaism and is considered part of the people but still has that distinction that he is not born into a Jewish family, just like grafting in of a Gentile to a Messianic community. So those are three levels. So then in order to understand what it's talking about, you have to understand which level it's talking about. And when we're talking about, I think you're talking about in the verses in this week's parasha, that's talking about any gear. It doesn't uh, say only, in other words, we're supposed to be righteous to all strangers regardless of their faith or their position in, in the greater scope of, of relationship to God. Uh, and that's important. Um, and this brings us to a, a thing that's, that's relevant to us today is uh, because this comes up quite a bit. People will quote these verses when they're talking about illegal immigration and how we deal with that. As a, how we as a community of faith deal with issues of illegal immigration. And uh, you have to remember that when we read these, like chapter 24, chapter 23, and so on, we're reading laws. This is not just arbitrary statements that are given. These are the laws for Israel that Israel was to uh, observe. And so when we're talking about these strangers, they're not saying, well, if strangers come in and rob your city, you're supposed to be nice to them. This is talking in reference to people that are abiding by the laws that are established and how we deal with them in their lives. Now, I will say this. Thank you. Um, I think we can do a better job of how we treat those that come over illegally, especially the children. But I also, and I've asked this to people before, because people talk about Trump putting uh, illegal children in cages and, and all that, which is horrible optics. Uh, and, but he wasn't the one that started that, nor as the president can he stop that. Because the laws are made by Congress, not by the president. And so when he got sworn in, he swore to obey the laws in how he implemented things. But the president doesn't make law. He abides by law and acts law, executes law. That's why we call it the executive branch. So laws have to be changed by Congress. But even at that, if, if and I've asked this to people who kind of attacked me because of my position, if you were the president and 100,000 unaccompanied minors all showed up on your border in less than 30 days. And by law, you couldn't turn them around and send them home. You also couldn't legally just let them free in the country. That according to laws, you have to be responsible and accountable for every one of those children, which means you have to watch them. You have to make sure they're safe. You have to make sure who they are and if they have parents and if the people they're traveling with are related to them and make sure they have medical care and make sure they have food and they have clothing and they have all those things. That's what the law says you have to do. 
You can't just put them in hotels because you can't supervise them in hotel rooms. You can't just put them into foster homes because we have a legal process for establishing foster care that takes time. You don't just say, I want to have a kid, and they bring you a kid that day. You have to go through a legal process to do this. The only reasoned way to do what they did was to put them in a holding facility that they would actually have visible observation of each of those children to make sure they were safe during that time. Now that's horrible. None of us would say that's our first choice in how to help children. But it's also necessary to accomplish what the law provides that we have to do. So while it's a horrible picture and none of us want to see children in, in cells or in chains or in cages or any way you want to describe that, the, al the alternative to that is turning these kids over to the streets with no job, no food, no home, no clothing, no medical care, no education, no protection, no nothing. And so we have to be rational about these things. Can we speed the process up? Yes. There are ways to speed the process up, but the laws have to be changed to accomplish that. And so anyhow, I don't want to go too side far on that, but it's just important that we understand we need to blame the right people for things. And uh, that doesn't mean that I don't think that President Trump hasn't made lots of mistakes, because I do. Uh, but that's not one. You know, you need to blame the right people for the right thing. And that's, that's not something. Okay. I'm going to go to Amanda's question. During the second temple, when Yeshua read from the Haftorah, did he participate in the Orthodox version of the Amidah standing prayer during the service? Yes and no. Who's Amanda? Okay, it doesn't say Amanda. That's my bad writing. No, it's my sorry. Okay, so anyhow, did he observe? The answer to that is yes and no. The reason I say that is portions of the Amidah weren't written until after his death. So he would not have done, for instance, the, the added additional verse of the Menim or the heretics wasn't there. So did he do the Orthodox version? He would have done portions of that were established. However, you have to remember... The Amidah, as well as almost all of the liturgy that is organized, is a replacement for temple worship. So in other words, the morning prayers describe and follow the pattern of the morning sacrifice. The early afternoon prayers, or the Mincha, they follow the pattern of the afternoon sacrifice. And the Ma'ariv prayers follow the pattern of the evening sacrifice. So while the prayers, some of the statements, because most of the Amidah is, is scripture or reference to scripture, it would not have been done in the way the Orthodox do it today because it wasn't established that way because the temple was still standing. They didn't need to do the morning Amidah prayers to replace temple service because they were doing temple service. So it's important to, to note that. The second thing is, uh, he was in a synagogue when he read from the Haftorah, not the temple. But I think you're just talking about the temple period and not the not a temple itself. But it's important to note, all of the liturgy that we do today and the, the form that it follows is established to replace the actions and activities of temple sacrificial service. So he would not have done the prayers the way we do it because they didn't exist in that format because they were designed to replace that format. But he would have said the things that were in the prayers because they were already established as scripture or in understanding by that time. Okay. In Hebrews 6, 1 through 2, is there something else that God's people need to be doing other than uh, to be doing other than leaving the principles of Messiah? It says not to keep laying the foundation of repentance from dead works. I'm going to read this because this is a really powerful um, statement. This is Hebrews 6, and I'm going to read from 1 through, uh, through verse uh, 9, I think. Uh, it says, Therefore, leaving the basic, basic teaching of Messiah, let's move on toward maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of trust in God, of teaching about immersions, plural, 
laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, having tasted the heavenly gift, having become partakers of the Ruach HaKodesh, and having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the Alam Haba, the world to come, and then having fallen away to renew again to repentance, since they are again crucifying Ben Elohim, the Son of God, for themselves publicly and publicly disgracing him. For the earth, having soaked up the rain, frequently falling on it, brings forth vegetation useful to those for whom it is farmed, and, share, and it shares in God's blessings. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to be cursed. Its end is to be burned. So let's start at the beginning because the question is, what else is there? Um, okay, so what he's talking to, he's talking to a, a group of people that are spiritually immature. And uh, to get, let me give you an example, and listen, especially those that, that have a Brownsville background, listen to everything that I'm going to say because I'm not downcasting Brownsville, I'm giving an example. Brownsville was a revival that took place in Pensacola, um, I don't know how many years ago now, 15, 20 years ago now, something like that. It's been a long time. And millions of people came through and they heard a message of repentance from sin and redemption through Messiah. What Brownsville didn't provide was a mechanism to mentor and disciple those people after that. They had the Brownsville School of Ministry, which took people and got them into ministry, but they didn't have a place for a million people to go and be attached to uh, mentors and be discipled after that. Their message was consistent. The whole time it was there, they preached repentance from sin and regeneration through the Ruach, the power of God's Spirit, redemption through Messiah. Their message of repentance was sound. It was positive. It was impactful. It changed lots of lives. But they didn't have a mechanism to then take those people and teach them now, they did for local, but they had a small... I mean, they, their building at the time when it started it was like 700 people. They couldn't possibly do it. It's not that I'm knocking them. It's kind of like what happens when 1,000 children show up at your border? What happens when 100,000 people show up at your congregation? There are, though, mechanisms that they could have used. For instance, Brownsville was part of the Assembly of God. They could have told each of those people, there are 100 Assembly of Gods in the area... Come here for the revival at night, but go there on Sunday and be part of that and join an a outreach group or a, 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 a home group or a discipleship club. Use the mechanism beyond our walls to mentor and disciple people. That didn't happen, or if it did, it didn't happen to a great extent. Again, not knocking the message or the effectiveness or what happened with those people. I believe people absolutely had their lives affected by the power and redemptive work of God. But there wasn't a mechanism for individual discipleship for that. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about here. You have lots of Jewish people, because the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish people, uh, and it's written to them, and he's saying, okay, you guys have repentance, Teachings about immersion, trusting God, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. They have the Brownsville message. But that's not the end. There's an entire lifestyle of how you're supposed to live and act and do. And you need to be discipled. You need to go on. And he says, and we're going to do this if, it, if time permits. If God permits, we're going to get this right. And then it goes on and says, because if we don't disciple these people... If we don't raise them up, they're going to fall away and go back to the world. And unfortunately, lots of the people that came through the Brownsville... And, and again, listen, Brownsville is just one of probably a hundred documented revivals that have taken place worldwide in the last hundred years or so. So it's not the only one. And I'm not knocking Brownsville because I respect their message and what they did... And I'm not denying the power that took place there, nor what went on. But there are a lot of people that walked away because there wasn't something that they could go to and wasn't somebody that could bring them aside and mentor them and teach them. And that's why this goes on. It says, 
And having fallen away, to return them to repentance, since they are crucifying Ben Elohim for themselves publicly. Now, those that say, well, those people really weren't saved, because that's usually the, uh, the message that we get from this. When somebody falls away in, in the once saved, always saved type camp, uh, they say, well, they just really weren't saved. Let me read what it actually says. For it is impossible for those who once were enlightened. Okay, so they've been enlightened. They've, God's light shined on them. You know, you could say if somebody came to a service and God's light shined on them and they felt the presence of God and got the little goosebumps and all that, but they never did, you know, they didn't really accept the Lord. You could, if it stopped there, you could almost validate that position. But it goes on to say, having tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Ruach HaKodesh. These are people that are spirit-filled people that had been enlightened by God. And then it goes on to say, and having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the Alam Habar, the world to come. There is no question that Paul is describing born-again believers in this passage that just never matured past when the seed was planted and the plant sprouted. And the, you know, Yeshua taught, he said that some get taken away, some get destroyed, some get stomped on, some get, and that's what happens to believers if they're not discipled. So discipleship is the next thing. It's not just saying, I love you, Lord, and fill me with your spirit. I'm going to go get immersed in water, have my sins washed away, and that's the end. I'm done. Uh, I've signed up, I've got my card, and I'm finished. There is a discipleship. There is a walking with God that is required. There's a faith path. Paul said, I've run the course. It's the course. I've finished my race. It's the race. It's what we're supposed to do in the Lord after that happens. That's walking into the door. After you get in the kingdom, you have to live kingdom. So anyhow... Going back to, is this yours also? Who did, going back to Matthew 6, 25, that's yours? As it relates to storing up, you're talking about storing up goods and, and for people? Yeah, we have, uh, I, I am a firm believer in the idea of benevolence and being prepared not only for ourselves but also for others and that that should start out at the household of God. The Bible says start first at the household of God. In other words, if there's a need and we have resources, we should first take care of needs in our community and then go out of our community to meet needs of other people. And we should store up to where we're doing that. It's too often a problem arises that if we had been prayerful and godly with our finances, it would never have become a problem because we're not praying about what to do with our finances. We habitually do it. When I evangelized, and I got just a couple minutes, but when I was evangelizing, uh, there were lots of times I would, they'd call me up, I'd sit on the BIM, or they didn't call it a BIM, I'd sit on the platform, and the pastor would take up the offering and all, and then I'd get up to speak and I'd say, look, some of you gave money in the offering tonight God didn't want. And you could hear the pastor sucking the air out of the the room because they don't you know there's most pastors don't want to hear the words you gave what God didn't want they want people to give as much as they can and, and I understand that and I want people to give as much as they can too but I want them to listen to God in doing so and I said there's times where a missionary or a special speaker comes and you get excited about their message and you get emotional about their message and somebody from Africa or India or Israel or somebody working with Holocaust survivors or somebody and you're, you are emotionally charged and you get your wallet out and you just empty your wallet and throw it in the basket and you're like, I did what God wanted me to do. And then you leave the synagogue and you get a flat tire. Or, you know, Sunday morning you wake up and you're just feeling really good. You were at service, you worshiped. You gave, you were a part of something bigger than yourself, you're just so excited, you walk out your house and your car's flat. And then you go, oh, and I don't have any money to fix that. And then you go, Lord, I can't believe you did this to me. 
Didn't you see what I did yesterday? I took every penny in my wallet and I gave it to you to be used for your kingdom. And God says, you didn't ask me. I had provided the money for this tire to be replaced, but you gave it to that missionary because you went on emotion instead of on obedience. And there's a huge difference between emotion and obedience. And we need to be aware of that. There are inversely, inversely opposite. Yeah, the inverse. There are people that don't give that God is pleading with them to give. Because he wants to bless and he wants to pour out into your life and he wants to do and, and, and your emotions well, I can't do this because of this or because of that or because of this or I'm angry or I'm upset or I'm disappointed or whatever. Your emotions won't let you give and so you're robbing yourself of the blessing. And listen, if you're the person with that flat tire, God had already blessed you with the money to pay for it and he wanted you to acknowledge that blessing when you were able to pay for it. So you were robbed of both recognizing his provision before and after because you didn't pray and ask him what to give. And likewise, many of us that don't give faithfully or don't give when God does tug on our heart to give are robbing ourselves of the blessing of receiving. And I'm going to save this passage question for next week because we're out of time. Thank you. Those of you that are watching online, I hope you'll tune in. Uh, in about 15 minutes as we begin our service, the same place at Britom Messianic Synagogue Facebook page. Shalom and blessings.